Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. And Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And it is brought to you by the Atlantic City Airport. Plan your next vacation now. Spirit Airlines is offering nonstop flights from Atlantic City International Airport to Boston, Atlanta, San Juan, Miami, and other exciting destinations. Visit Spirit. Com. Did you know, on this day, 89 years ago, the Philadelphia Eagles franchise was born, Jeff Mosher. Today is the Eagles' birthday. How are you, friend? I'm great. I'm great. Are we celebrating? Well, I was going to kind of get your overview on mm-hmm. just how successful of a franchise the Eagles have been. You know... In the history of doing this show, you know, the Eagles have won one Super Bowl. Well, in the history of their franchise, they have won one Super Bowl. And they get right. chastised for that a lot by especially rival NFC East fans. The Giants, Washington, and Dallas all have won more. Now, 89 years ago today, the Eagles were born. But they have more than just one Super Bowl. So Correct. in the history of the Philadelphia Eagles, when you look at this franchise, we were talking about this yesterday. You know, since 97, the Eagles have won the most NFC East division titles. I don't know how much that means. What are the Eagles? Where is this franchise? What kind of success would you look at this franchise? How would you kind of break it down? The Eagles are like a, um, uh, I guess, an inverted sandwich or hoagie in that (laughs) – they had that good beginning with the Chuck Bednarik days and, you know, the the championships that they won before the Super Bowl. Then they went through some really dry years during the, um, when the, when the, the, during the merger, when the NFL was coming into light, when they were owned by Toast and Brayman and then Jeffrey Lurie took over and Andy Reid. And, you know, from that point to now, that's like the other sort of meat with the kind of the bread in the middle. That's what I, I, I would, that's how I would put them. When you look at, I guess, maybe the – around the league, how are they yeah. kind of viewed as a franchise? When, when you compare them to the Cowboys and the Giants and whatever the Washington team wants to go by this year, you know, yeah. do people view them as above them? Or do they say, nah, they only had that one Super Bowl, they're not quite on the level of – like how much is their one Super Bowl factored in to the way they're viewed around the league? Um, well, people tend to view the league kind of in with recency bias, right? So, um, I, and that's a hard question to ask. Like, are they considered one of the storied franchises in the NFL? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, there have been some legendary figures of the game going back to those Bednarik and Van Brocklin days who have played in Philadelphia, Reggie White, of course, right? Brian Dawkins. Um, so they are a big part of the history of the league and the organization. And I would say since Jeffrey Lurie took over, they've been, been more regarded as a franchise, a, a good atmosphere, a place where a player would enjoy. And that, I mean, look, Mike, how many people who played for the Eagles over the last 20 years stay in the area, right? I think that's, that's a good part of enjoying the culture, the fan base, the organization. It's not like they just stay in the area and divorce themselves from the organization. A lot of guys are actively involved. And I think that that says a lot because before that, we know, I mean, we know that, you know, Reggie White, part of his lawsuit was to help free agency. The Eagles were kind of not considered great from an ownership standpoint before Jeffrey Lurie took over and maybe not the most player friendly team when it came to contracts and, and what you wanted. So, I think that they're viewed very favorably in a macro lens as far as what they are to the NFL, what Jeffrey Lurie is to the to the group of owners, his influence, which he has some. So there's certainly um, a big part of that, you know, as success, you know, they're not obviously a laughing stock by any means. They're not the Browns they're not the Jets or the Raiders. Um, They're considered generally a good franchise that has its peaks and valleys, and doesn't tend to have either one for very long amounts of time, save for that tenure, the first 10 years of Andy Reid's uh, tenure. Yeah, you wonder how much of that Andy Reid tenure 
shape the way that we think of the team in the post Andy Reid era? A lot. It should a lot. I mean, I think the proof's in the pudding, right? I mean, he went out to Kansas City, which is one of those franchises that's, you know, right there, Super Bowl one and everything like that. A lot of tradition. Hank Stram. Uh, before Andy got there, though, they were they were in a bad way since I guess since what the end of Dick Vermeil when he was with them and and Priest Holmes that was the team right where where he had kind of gotten them into uh, double digit wins and in the playoffs and then they went through a streak there where they were you know they had some serious issues I mean they had a, a linebacker who committed suicide in the parking lot and that started to sort of mark the low point of what the Chiefs were becoming um, just. And, and that, that's not a criticism. I'm just, just saying, like, they were mired um, at that point from Herm Edwards and Romeo Cornell and Todd Haley. And, and then, bam, Andy goes there, and they literally just start winning immediately, right? I mean, immediately. I think they won 11 games his first year there. And they were in the playoffs three of his first four years. And then eventually Patrick Mahomes era begins and Super Bowls. And I don't see them missing the playoffs any time in the next few years as long as they stay healthy and productive. So... I think you have to look at the Jeffrey Lurie tenure and tie it in with Andy Reid because even their Super Bowl came from a head coach who came up through the Andy Reid tree, so to speak. So, yeah, I mean, the guy is, has a lot of winning in his, in his blood and in his DNA and brought it here when Jeffrey Lurie hired him, Yeah, you which know, was a very controversial decision, by the way, at the time. So, so Jeffrey deserves credit for that. And then Joe Banner. I was just going to say, you know, if you know that Andy was not the popular choice – to get hired. That is one thing that this team has kind of done, even to where they are now, where they hired a guy in Nick Sirianni. I mean, I remember the day that his name popped up, thinking to myself, this is going to be the guy they hired because they always hire that guy. They've gone outside the box pretty much with all their hires. Doug Peterson, even Chip Kelly was a guy that they other people wanted, but he was not an NFL guy. He was an outside-the-box guy. I remember the day that Jeff Lurie said, hey, we want to be five years ahead of being five years ahead, and they right. bring in Chip Kelly. Yeah, no, I mean, Jeffrey Lurie has never been afraid to think differently, to pivot. Obviously, he pivoted away from Chip Kelly as fast as he pivoted toward Chip Kelly. He's not afraid to make a decision that might look rash on the surface, but seeing the long-term benefits, I think the firing of Doug Peterson after one bad year uh, is probably a good example of that. I'm not sitting here saying it was definitely the right move or the wrong move. I'm just illustrating to you how Jeffrey Lurie thinks. He knew that Doug Peterson was the only coach to win him a Super Bowl. Um, he knew that Doug Peterson made the playoffs, what, four out of the, three out of the four, four out of five years. But in his mind, he believed, in his heart, he believed that the trend was going the wrong way and that two, three years down the road, it was not going to get better um, with the way they were de- not developing talent and with the way they were bringing in different coaches and not seeing different results under Doug Peterson and, and with the way Doug – handled his coaching staff himself, and Jeffrey Lurie felt like he needed to make a a change for the betterment of the franchise long-term, even though it looked rash at the time and and still might for some. Yeah, I mean, you you know, we take a look back at where this all kind of started is, you know, he hires Andy, uh, Andy goes on that run, then Andy kind of burns out, flames out, and then, he takes a shot by going to Chip Kelly, quickly decides that wasn't the way to go, gets out of that, goes to Peterson, who was kind of a, you know, I don't want to say controversial hire, but nobody else had him on the radar. And it goes to where we are now that Lori still has such ties to that Reed era, and it's almost like he tries to recreate it and keep it. And people ask all the time about Roseman and why he almost, because he is a link to that Reed era almost. Yeah. Yes. That's why I sometimes think Andy, because people are so sour on the fact that he didn't win a Super Bowl, sort of forget the blueprint that he laid here in Philadelphia or set here in Philadelphia that Howie Roseman and Joe Banner then, they still follow. It's not like Howie Roseman got to the organization and said the biggest thing, the most important thing we have to do is be strong in the trenches, offensive line and defensive line. That was a Andy Reid – and, of course, the Eagles had great offensive linemen and defensive linemen in their history. But I don't – and Buddy Ryan was great at identifying defensive linemen. But you remember, Buddy could care less about offense. So Andy truly had a model to success that he felt was long-term and sustainable by, A, building in the trenches, B, obviously having a great quarterback, 
and then see he really you know felt like he had to stop the passing game with a pass rush and corners and some of that is obvious but some of it as you look around the NFL isn't so obvious and that has been the blueprint that both the organization uh really yeah the organization has followed even with Andy gone all right Jeff Mosher inside the birds.com the inside the birds podcast so we got off on that conversation and it kind of took us down a little bit of a fun rabbit hole it's uh the Eagles birthday today 89 years uh, on this day the Eagles were born so Let's look at this year's team a little bit. I want to ask you about a couple of guys uh, under the radar that we haven't discussed a lot throughout this summer and this offseason and get your thoughts on how they fit in. I want to start with Milton Williams and where you think uh, his role is because he was a guy that I thought last year showed some flashes, and now his name seems to be under the radar a bit because there's so many other options on that defensive front, and I'm wondering – where he fits in on this style of defense, which we don't even know what that style is yet, but where we think he might fit in. Well, you just answered that, you know, in your own question, is that not knowing the style of defense and the alignments uh, specific to down and distance, it's hard to answer. But I do feel like what Milton Williams showed last year, which is a nice little burst, I mean, he played well against uh, the run and the pass. Um, but, I, you know, his name has come up recently for us in the, at Inside the Birds because of Bo Allen's retirement last week. And if you think back to 2017, Bo Allen played 43% of the snaps. He was the third defensive tackle, and he was very rarely on the field for pass rush, but he was still played 43% of the snaps because he was a very important second string run defender. Um, and he was also in a lot of those games, late third, fourth quarter, because the Eagles blew out teams that year. So he got a chance to play, but he was significant. He was important on a line that went about seven deep, if you think about it, between ends and tackles. And now you look at Milton Williams. Can he be that same guy? As the third defensive tackle, um, can he play You know, anywhere from 40 to 50% of the snaps as the team maybe tries to preserve Fletcher Cox a little bit? So let's say it's like third and three, right, which could be a passing down in the NFL, could also be a running down in the NFL. Would you like to maybe keep – Cox off the field there, put a 3-4 look, have Jordan Davis in the middle as a nose tackle, and then have him flanked by, say, Javon Hargrave and Milton Williams as your three interior linemen with Hassan Reddick and uh, Josh Sweat as your edges. That that still puts you in your 5-1 look um, because you're probably a nickel at that point in case they pass. But it gives Milton Williams an opportunity to get at the, the, the quarterback if it's a pass but if they're going to try to spring a run there on third and three, you got Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, and Javon Hargrave to try to stop that, uh, you know, up front. So I think there'll be some opportunities because he can play three, four end in certain situations, and he can play four, three defensive tackle, the three technique, and he can also play four, three the defensive end. So look, the Eagles have are deep in name because they've got guys like. Josh Sweat, not just Josh Sweat, but like Derek Barnett is back and Brandon Graham's back. But you really don't know what to expect from some of these guys. I mean, Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, and Barnett were all on the Super Bowl team. And this is five years later. So I think, you know, if, if there's a decline in play or if there's another injury, then Milton Williams is a guy that they might look to to get on the field more. Yeah, well, Milton Williams, I brought him up first is because I was kind of uh, intrigued by what he did last year. But in, in, in a 3-4 look, I don't know if they do play 3-4. Is he a tackle? Is he an end? I mean, is he long enough to play end? Is he uh, right. a nose? He doesn't seem like he's big enough to be a nose. So I'm wondering if he kind of gets miscasted in this new look defense that we anticipate coming. Yeah, one thing I've said is that I think he can be, because he's a bigger guy, normally in a 3-4 defense, you have that big, huge, monstrous nose tackle, which is what Jordan Davis would be. And then your two defensive ends aren't really pass rushers. Your outside linebackers are your pass rushers, like what the Steelers have with T.J. Watt, right? He's an, he's an outside linebacker, a pass rusher. Uh, your ends tend to be bigger guys than 4'3". They'll be 280 to 300 pounds, which is what Milton Williams is. But they also t- Milton has short arms. That was one of the reasons he's a third-round pick, despite testing really well. And short-arm guys tend to struggle against the run. So I don't know that he's going to be out there – in a 3-4 look if they're playing a 3-4 look on first down. But like I said, if there's that middle at third and three, third and four, you don't know if they're going to run or pass, third and two, I think situationally he could play defensive end in a 3-4 alignment. But I don't know that he's really 
what you want. He's certainly not the, the prototype for that. Um, all right, I want to get another opinion from a, a player who's maybe – he hasn't even been here before, and and that's Zach Pascal and how he fits in because I don't think a lot of people know a lot about him and what to expect. And we seem to be talking a lot about AJ Brown and Smith and Quez Watkins. Those three guys get a lot. Rigger, because of his negatives, um, Ortega Whiteside because he's changed positions. But what about Zach Pascal? What what kind of player? Uh, what kind of fit is he? <laughs> it's funny. Real quick on Rigger. He, he's starting to fall into that category of like when you when you, you look at the team and you say, give me a, a sleeper or an unheralded or an un, unlike talk, under-discussed player who could have a breakout year. I keep saying, well, it could be Jalen Rager. I mean, he did have a, from, from everything we were told, not to, to put a whole lot of stock in the offseason program, but he came back very focused, very intent, you know, disciplined, mature, did everything they asked. And obviously, we know he's if he's catching the ball – He's got explosion and talent. They just have to figure out a way that he has to figure out a way to catch the ball and they have to get the ball to him. But it's amazing that your first round pick from two years ago could be the unheralded under discussed guy, but that's where we are. Uh, <laughs> but if he's not, if he is on the team and he, or if he's just not performing uh, or if he is traded, obviously that does open up that slot between a guy like Quez Watkins, who's a vertical slot can stretch the field or Zach Pascal, who's more like your, your, your lunch pail, you know, you need three or four yards on first down, Jason Avant like, and I hope Jay wouldn't, you know, you know, be upset with me for saying that. Uh, but but that kind of guy, a guy who can give you some middle of the field production. He's not going to be explosive. He's not going to break away, but he is going to catch the ball. He can block a little bit if you want to run on a third and three, and you need your interior receiver to put a crackback block on a linebacker. He can do all those things, and and he does it well, and he's a a great leader. So that there's opportunity for him. But it sort of feels like the opportunity for him has to come only if a couple of other guys aren't doing the job really well. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, um, he's a guy that uh, came from Indianapolis, so he knows uh, Sirianni a little bit, and you wonder if that puts him over somebody else. But it seems that he would not be – I mean, everybody seems to really be high on Watkins. He's obviously not going to be above the other two, so you wonder how much that actually gets him, how much playing time that actually gets him. Yeah, they have to find out, and I'm sure that that's what they're going to be doing in training camp and start of the season, is if that if they if Quez Watkins' skill set can translate well to the slot. Ordinarily, a guy with that kind of speed, you want on the perimeter, you want him drawing flags downfield, you want him commanding defensive attention to open up the field for others. And ordinarily, with a slot receiver, you want a really refined route runner. You want someone who can do what Jason Avant did, which is – Without much speed, he was still able to run the precise routes, make the right head fakes, and catch everything thrown at him. So Quez has not necessarily been known as the most precise route runner, but it's year three. Maybe that's something he's wor- been working on all offseason, and he's, I believe he said he's been studying some slot receivers, and so maybe that study he takes from – takes from that and, and can be your, your vertical slot receiver. Well, and, and I bring up Zach, too. I mean, he tweeted the other day, uh, actually, this morning, I guess it was. Man, the day is uh, – that's, that's what kind of day it's been. He tweeted this morning, y'all be thinking I'm just a blocking wide receiver. Nah, I will really route someone's ass up with the uh, Ben Simmons, you know, emoji with the smoke coming out of his nose. Uh, and And people forget – you know, he, there's a guy who's caught a lot of touchdown passes. He's got 15 touchdowns since 2018. So he's one of them guys that always just kind of finds his way in the red zone. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, um, <laughs> man, first of all, if I if I see the smoking nose uh, emoji one more, I, I wouldn't mind never seeing that emoji ever again because it's just painful reminders of every Ben Simmons tweet. <laughs> but, um, but I think that's the, what he said is something probably would make Jason Devon proud. Like, don't just look at me as a blocker. I can route people up. I know what it takes to beat the type of coverage that I typically see in the slot, and I'm and I'll catch everything. So that's a great attitude and mentality to have. The last guy I want to get your thoughts on. It's not a guy. It's a group. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Menudo? it's it's the Teron Jackson, Patrick Johnson. You know that group of players who were. Got playing time last year uh, as late round picks. Are they lost in the sauce? Do, do they like those guys? You know, wh- what do you think of that like group of uh, lower 
drafted players who got some playing time last year. And, and you know, I don't want to say they jumped off the page or anything, but, you know, that, right. uh, that got a playing time as sixth and seventh rounders. So, I mean, let's start with Teron Jackson and just do the numbers. And, and, you know, it's really hard to see him making the team unless he just outperforms like crazy. I mean, look at this defensive line. Jordan Davis already, right? That's one. Fletcher Cox, two. Javon Hargrave is three. Milton Williams is four. Uh, Derek Barnett, five. Brandon Graham, six. Okay. Uh, A guy like Teron Jackson is a pass rusher. So if you want to throw, oh, I didn't even say Josh Sweat. Josh Sweat, seven. And you want to throw a guy like Hassan Reddick in just as a pass rusher. I mean, where does Teron Jackson fit at that point? I mean, Marlon Tui Pelotu was trying to make this team too, um, along with the UDFA Luther Ellis. So there's just a lot of bodies there. So I I just don't know that. I think it's going to be a real uphill battle for Teron Jackson to make the team. And, and as far as Patrick Johnson, now he's got a better opportunity because what he did, la- what he was last year was basically what Jannard Avery was. He was Jannard Avery's backup. He was that fifth guy on the line of scrimmage, kind of playing that strong side linebacker spot that now Hassan Reddick has got. Um, but Jannard Avery would come off the field. Patrick Johnson would come off the field and pass rush. So to me, if you're going to play this style and you're going to have an overhang linebacker like, like uh, Hassan Reddick is, you need a backup because if Hassan Reddick gets hurt, you can't just roll up your defense and run a different alignment. You need somebody to get in there and do what he does. So to me, you got Patrick Johnson and the kid that they drafted this year out of Kansas, I think in the sixth round, right? Kyron Kyron Johnson or Kyron Johnson. Those two guys are probably going to jockey and battle back and forth to be Hassan Reddick's backup at the strong side linebacker spot. So those are two guys that, you know, probably don't factor in all that much is what you're saying. And then, like, you know, you had uh, Jacoby yeah, Stevens. Teams right, they, they drafted. Invest, he yeah. didn't get a lot of playing time last year. They, they He was a safety. They're going to move him to linebacker. And if you right. were saying, hey, he had a year of development at linebacker, it seems that linebacker year be lost in the sauce now too. Yeah, you're talking about Jacob, Jacoby Stevens, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah, in fact, Adam and I were saying on the pod that dropped, this, uh, dropped Thursday morning, um, might make sense to move him back to safety just because right there is a spot where you could need, you need the help and need the bodies and he could theoretically compete more now that you've upgraded linebacker the way you have. But I don't know if they want to throw away the year of development that they put on him at linebacker and if, for, for him to probably make the team and only play on special teams anyway. All right, uh, Jeff Mosher, happy birthday, Eagles. Uh, the weekend is here, right? Uh, it's uh, it's amazing. As we did yesterday, our preview of the NFC uh, South. Uh, that means we are getting closer to training camp because we only have two previews left. That'll be the next couple Thursdays with Andrew, uh, Adam. I'll be back next week. Jeff will be back next week. The new Inside the Birds podcast drops uh, Monday morning, six a.m. They'll have a new freshie out for you guys as well. All right, Mosh, have a great rest of your weekend, bud. All right, man. Have a good one. There's Jeff Mosher from Inside the Birds podcast, insidethebirds.com.